A bit about Dr. John Sutton. After his service in the U.S. Air Force, Dr. Sutton completed his Master of Arts degree at the University of Central Arkansas and his Ph.D. at the University of Tennessee. He taught at Louisiana Tech and Arizona State, and then in 1987, he joined the faculty of Francis Marion. At FMU, he taught courses in American literature and business communication. Meanwhile, he remained active in the Tennessee Air National Guard. Dr. Sutton retired from full-time teaching in 2012, but he still teaches part-time for Francis Marion. Join me now in welcoming our friend and colleague, Dr. John Sutton, whose address is entitled, Professor's Progress, The Precarious Path to Ignorance. John? All right, first thing, I, I gotta put y'all on Facebook here. <laughs> All right, so you're on my next post here. <laughs> Bill Moran was always one of my favorite people. Uh, after all, he and Bob Parham hired me as well as Richard. Uh, and besides that, we're both products of the English department at the University of Tennessee. Uh, I still remember Dean Moran's way of leaning back in a chair at the committee meeting, hands crossed over his knees, eyes slightly closed, saying, uh, the issue would then be, uh, and followed by some crystalline clarification of whatever the issue was, <laughs> silence would follow all those present being struck dumb. <laughs> I'm thinking, geez, you can't argue with that. <clears throat> he was the best meeting handler I ever worked with, and in my years as commander of a military unit, I always tried to model my management style after his. As my bio points out, I led a double life for many years, combining that military life with the teaching of literature in academe. As Frost said, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. But unlike Frost, I alternated between the two roads <laughs> and thus spent most of my time being lost in the woods. <laughs> I often felt like my head was the clapper of a bell as I was battered back and forth between right and left, politically speaking. <clears throat> but here I am, retired from both with nothing but an echoed ringing in my ears that doesn't seem to go away. My wife Nancy and I are very pleased to be here with you today along with my children Anna and Jim and my sister Mary Ann and her husband Don. <clears throat> and the kid's babysitter, April Burdeau Watson, who was a graduate of Francis Marion English, the class of <laughs> very recently. <laughs> I must say the intimidation factor at this point uh, is huge. There's so many brilliant people here, all expecting me to say something intelligent for a change. Uh, and I feel like a dog surrounded by four trees. <laughs> I don't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> I guess I should explain <clears throat> the title of this lecture before I get into it too far. Professor's Progress, The Precarious Path to Ignorance. Now, someone whose name rhymes with Kanka <laughs> complained to me that the title seemed too pessimistic. But uh, you have to keep in mind that I come from a long line of pessimists. <laughs> it's a family trait, especially in all Sutton males. When optimists tell us this is the best of all possible worlds, we're likely to respond, yeah, I'm afraid you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't see <clears throat> the address really as something pessimistic as ironic. It is irony in its finest. Irony, the master trope, is not just a literary term applied to O. Henry stories. It is a heart of existence. I see it everywhere. It's the irony of life I want to talk about today. Isn't it ironic, I see? Isn't it ironic? <laughs> that we pursue a life of learning from the age of 18 when we know just about everything 
and wind up at 65 pondering all those things we don't know. As I delved into this topic, I be began to discover uh, some of the ways this ironic progression works. As the typical freshman comp student would put it, quote, there are three ways in which professors get dumber as they get older. <laughs> so I guess that's my thesis. <clears throat> to begin with, we must consider what we mean by how much you think you know. It's all relative and it depends on how much you know there is to know. I call this the knowledge paradox. It's not just how much erudite stuff is in your brain, it's a ratio between how much you know and how much you know there is to know. If we look at this visually with these handy dandy graphs I put together on the slides, uh, <clears throat> with my expansive mathematical knowledge of set theory I gained as a teenager, perhaps I can clarify this, clarify this point. Perhaps not. <clears throat> but first, we have a graphic representation of what we are aware of that is out there to know. This is the my universe. Obviously, this depends on your experience in the world, your education, uh, and your awareness of what's out there. Now, we add another circle, represent how much of that my universe circle we think we do know. The remaining portion is what I call the don't know crescent. This is our perception of what we don't know in our personal universe. So now, if we compare two quite different people, we find something interesting. On the left is John Doe, high school dropout pizza delivery guy. His eighth grade trip to the <clears throat> capital was the only time he was out of the county. But at 32, he pretty much knows all there is to know in his my universe. On the right, we have Dr. Jane Doe from MIT, physics professor summa cum laude, graduate from Harvard with a double major in physics and comparative literature, <laughs> who went straight to the PhD in astrophysics at Princeton, and now she has researched and taught at MIT for 20 years. Obviously, she knows 50 times more than he ever dreamed existed. But then, if we look at what they don't know, her don't know crescent is vastly larger than his don't know crescent. <clears throat> In their own worlds then, what she doesn't know is huge compared to what he doesn't know. <laughs> what gets you out of this John Doe mode is the breadth of education and experience, but you pay a price for that in that intellectual growth. Instead of thinking as Dryden did that the things we must believe are few and plain, you begin to think more in terms of, if it seems simple, you ain't looking close enough. <laughs> As a 21-year-old undergrad at Indiana University, I thought I was knowledgeable of Emily Dickinson. After all, I'd read 20 or 30 of her poems, and had even read the introductory bio on her in our anthology. So off I went to the professor Edwin Cady, one of the noted American literature scholars of the time, about a paper I wanted to write. He asked me some very pointed questions about the additions of her work, her letters, the body of criticism on her, and then proceeded to tear my knowledge of Dickens into shreds. I learned a very valuable lesson that day. English professors can be arrogant bastards. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Some people just don't recognize brilliance when it's right inside. <laughs> As Hausman said, but I was one in 20, no use to talk to me. <laughs> now in graduate school years later, I discovered that the process of earning a PhD was a path to the beginning of your studies, not to the finish of them. By the time I finished my degree, I had caught a glimpse of how much there was to know about Hawthorne, about literature, about life. My don't know crescent had expanded at many times the rate of the what I know part, <clears throat> and has continued to do so ever since. That's one reason I see myself ironically going backward in the learning process, 
my universe has kept expanding at twice the rate of my ability to learn and to remember. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, those were the good old days. <laughs> Another reason we gain ignorance <clears throat> has to do with the aging process itself. This affects not only scholars, but all people to varying degrees. Dr. Johnson, the 18th century one, not the one who is sitting over here today, <clears throat> wrote in The Vanity of Human Wishes, Year chases year, decay pursues decay, still drops some joy from withering life away. In life's last scene, what prodigies surprise, fears of the brave and follies of the wise. From Marlborough's eyes, the streams of dotage flow, and swift expires a driveler and a show. Here Johnson gives us a brief pathetic portrait of the most famous military leader of the day, Marlborough, and the great writer and satirist, Jonathan Swift in their senility. Even the brave and the wise reach this sad end if they live long enough. I'm sure many of you have dealt with family members in advanced states of dementia, or are dealing with it now, or will require your younger family members to deal with it in the future. <laughs> <laughs> My father, suffered from severe dementia in his latter years, and so I'm quite familiar, as Marianne is, and the kids, in, uh, of the symptoms. In addition to that, he went blind when he was about 70 uh, and was forced to retreat within his own mind for the last 20 years of his life since his sense of the outside world was diminished. Unfortunately, inside his mind was not always a great place to be. I told you all Sutton males uh, were pessimists. At some point in every day, Dad would say, this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> some days he said it three or four times. With ambiguous irony, I would respond, there's always tomorrow, Dad. <laughs> The saddest part of this combination of dementia and blindness was that during the last 15 years of his life, he woke up every day to discover that he had gone blind. When my brother came to check on him, as he did every morning, Dad would stagger out to the kitchen and say, Don, I've got some bad news. I can't see. Of course, my brother Don, after having heard this every morning for the last seven years, would react in various ways, depending on his mood. Usually you would just say, no, Dad, you've been blind for years. Dad would attempt to argue the point while Don fixed him breakfast. But if Don was feeling a bit mischievous when Dad gave him the bad news, he would fall on the floor in a melodramatic fit, weeping and say, oh, Father, Father, tell me it's not so. <clears throat> that had really set Dad off, <clears throat> complaining about cruel, uncaring sons and so forth. During his last 10 years, he had frequent visual hallucinations. He pushed my sister-in-law into a busy street one day while she was taking him for a walk. He explained he pushed her out of the way of a man he saw standing in front of her on the sidewalk. He didn't know why she couldn't see him. Frequently, he would ask people what he saw around us. Or <clears throat> one evening, we were sitting in the living room, and he said, uh, who are those people standing in the corner? What do they look like? I asked him. Well, there's a woman in a green dress and a dark hat. Two men beside her. The one with the beard is wearing a suit and the other guy is naked. <laughs> I was thinking, the psychological implications of this were just too much for me to comprehend. So I decided not to pursue it. Instead, I asked him, how clearly do you see them? He said, oh, they're clear as day. I can describe everything about them. And I said, Dad, you know you're blind, right? <laughs> and he looked at me a little leery of where this was going and said, uh, yeah. And he said, then they're not real. <clears throat> if you see something clearly, it's not there. Your brain is making up for your blindness by giving you something to look at. 
He considered that for a few seconds and then settled back in his chair, a little myth that we wouldn't tell him who these people were and why they were in his living room. Finally, we had to put him in a nursing home because it became too much of a danger to himself and others. After a few weeks in the home, the administrators called and wanted us to take him back. <laughs> Seems he had made a habit of sitting in the lobby and pulling the walkers out from the old ladies when they passed by. <laughs> that was it. That first Christmas Eve, after we put him in the home, my siblings and I were at Don's house for dinner when we got a call from the nursing home saying Dad wanted to talk to him. And Dad got Don on the phone and said he didn't think he could make it for dinner. He'd been sitting for hours in the train station, but no trains were coming. We finally figured out that he'd been sitting in the lobby of the home where a lot of other residents were sitting around on the benches, and it seemed like a train station or a bus station or something, and his imagination took over. That was pathetically sad and funny at the same time. To this day, my brothers and my mean sister <coughs> give me a hard time about Dad not remembering me in his last few years. My four siblings, he remembered. But when someone mentioned John, he looked puzzled and asked who John was. When they explained I was his youngest child, he'd just shake his head and say, I don't remember him being around here that much. <coughs> <laughs> so now when I call Marianne or one of my brothers, they always say, John, John? I don't remember you being around here that much. <laughs> I guess that's why it scares me so much when I see the signs of this fading memory appearing in myself. I began to notice this a couple of years ago, those little moments of panic when I would not remember something I should know. I'd be in the classroom saying something like, this poem bears a similar theme to uh, <clears throat> Uh, another poem uh, by, um, oh, what's her name, um, you know, images, uh, smoke cigars, father was a Harvard president, about this time, some smart ass kid in the back would say, Amy Lowell, I just googled it on my phone while you were stammering. <laughs> so, I feared it was time to retire, <clears throat> and here I am. Now, as my don't know crescent keeps on expanding and expanding, my what I know circle just keeps on shrinking. <laughs> There's my dad, I forgot. And my dad's dog, Chloe. Cleo. 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 <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for that demonstration. <clears throat> Another contributing factory, fact, factory, factor to the uh, increasing ignorance is the slippery nature of knowledge itself. It never seems to stand still. It's valid one moment and invalid the next. Samuel Arbusman, a Harvard mathematician, has a popular book called The Half-Life of Facts, in which he discusses the accelerating rate at which contemporary factual knowledge goes out of date. I remember someone at commencement a couple years back, I think it was Dr. Carter, telling the students that half of what they learned in college would be invalid within six years. I think it was. The, the, yeah. <laughs> the, the, but the point of that being that they needed to devote themselves to a lifetime of study in order to keep up. But it brought a heavy sigh from the students across the aisle from us as they saw that time and money spent on college swirling down the drain, <laughs> half of it every six years. Now, people who work in science and technology are quite aware of this principle of knowledge obsolescence, but believe that literature and the humanities are not subject to this kind of change. After all, once you've read Hamlet, you've got it, right? <clears throat> the, thing, <clears throat> the study of literature doesn't change. This belief is patently false. That's like saying once you've learned the structure of the carbon atom, you've got it. Chemistry doesn't change after that. <clears throat> Yes, time has its hand even in the humanities, stirring things up and changing the structure of knowledge. Literary theories come and go. Literary canon changes constantly. Theories and methods of teaching are ever changing. No matter what your field, it's difficult to keep up with those changes. 
besides this change of knowledge over time, there is also the issue of discovering all those things that you were taught early in life that may not be true. It takes half a lifetime to unlearn a lot of the things that you were taught as a child. My parents were hardcore Republicans, so as a child, I assumed that was the correct political viewpoint. I remember when Kennedy was elected, I was scared out of my wits because at 11 years old, I believe fully in all the fear-mongering political statements that come out during presidential elections. And then they said, if Kennedy's elected, we won't be able to afford a dozen eggs because we'll all starve. I said, uh, well, my oldest brother, Tom, was already at the Air Force Academy at that time and was the pride and joy of the entire family. We other siblings have always called Tom the white sheep of the family. <laughs> the rest of us, <clears throat> merely black sheep wastrels. Mind you, I'm not com uh, complaining about that, and those are not unjust labels. At school, the rest of us were always uh, a big disappointment to teachers because they were always hoping for another something like Tom. <laughs> I had three uncles in the military in World War II, which ended just four years before I was born. We, like many baby boomers, were raised to believe in the honor of being a soldier and fighting for truth, justice, in the American way. We watched John Wayne and Randolph Scott fight the Redskins, the Jerrys, the Japs, and all those post-war romanticized war movies. This was my concept of war as I was growing up. When I went to college, I rebelled, as youths will do, <clears throat> and became a wild-eyed hippie radical, hiding in the bushes to throw rocks at the ROTC bass drum as they marched by just to get them out of step. <laughs> Our student body president at Indiana was a Black Panther and was always in trouble or in jail. Our old library somehow caught fire and burned to the ground. Still a mystery. The Kent State Massacre took place in the neighboring state of Ohio. Professors would actually schedule a two-week gap in the spring syllabus because they knew the campus would be shut down for riots at some point. And they were right. They always was. Call me a romantic, but I miss those days. <laughs> but then, I won the lottery. First drawing I ever won in my life. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it wasn't the Powerball lottery, it was the draft lottery. <laughs> I considered becoming a Canadian immigrant, but I knew it would mean breaking all the ties with my family. Brother Tom had, by that time, spent a year in Vietnam during the peak of the fighting was awarded the Air Force Silver Star, two distinguished flying crosses for gallantry in action against an enemy of the United States. I couldn't disgrace my family, so upon graduation, I went from being the long-haired hippie freak here to a Steve Canyon type. <laughs> <laughs> can see the... The portrait behind me there is a portrait that a friend of mine did of me in college. So there's the, the hippie freak behind me in my mess dress uniform. I was surprised once again to find the truth had been misrepresented somehow. These people that I worked with in the Air Force were not, surprisingly enough, a bunch of brainless, heartless automatons, but people just like me. One time at the officers club, we got to comparing college majors and we were all amazed to find that nearly half of us in the group were English majors. In addition, there was a sense of family among the military group working in unison, often under extreme stress. There is a sense of brother and sisterhood among military people that I have seldom seen elsewhere. Later, when I was in graduate school, I found that people in my air guard unit asked constantly if I needed anything for the family when the kids were little because they knew we were financially stressed. Meanwhile, the professors at school took up collections for Nigerian children but did little or nothing to support the single mothers and the struggling families in their own graduate programs. Going to Southeast Asia was a life-changing experience for me. Ubon, Royal Thai Air Force Base, Thailand. 
The best way I can explain this is by relating, relating an uh, actual incident that happened in Germany a couple years later. When I first arrived in Germany, I stayed with another officer while I looked for lodging. We had similar backgrounds <clears throat> and got along very well, spending the evenings on the veranda, talking long into the night. One day, after work, I was waiting for him in his car to ride home. It was about a half hour late. When he got there, I knew from his grim expression and pale features that something was very wrong. When we got into the car, I noticed his arms and fatigues were stained with blood. After a long silence, he explained, an autistic little girl, about nine or ten, had been walking with her parents near the front gate of the base when she suddenly lurched into the road right in front of a car. Rob saw it happen and ran to help. The girl had a severe head injury and was without a pulse, so Rob did CPR until medical help arrived, but they could not bring her back. We rode home in silence, <clears throat> and when we got to the house, I felt like I should say something to get him to open up about it. And at this point, I said one of the stupidest things I ever said in my life. It was something like, it just makes you think how tenuous life is. It can be gone in a second. Rod looked me square in the face with those steel gray eyes. He says, that's funny. I was just thinking how much cranial fluid stinks. I thought about that brief exchange for a long time, <clears throat> and it helped me better understand the traumatic experience of war. You shouldn't try to intellectualize something so visceral as violent death. It removes it from the real, the present, from the sunshine, to borrow Hawthorne's symbol, and it shoves it into the moonlight of the abstract, where it is more distant and hypothetical. I have since had many discussions with veterans about their experience in the war zones, and the conversations are always accompanied by the smell of cranial fluid. Yes, I've had pilots killed while I was controlling them on radar. Yes, I've controlled the rescue aircraft as they go out to retrieve the bodies. It's not the same experience as the soldier who is splattered with his buddy's flesh and bone when he steps on a bouncing Betty or is hit by an RPG. As in the incident with Rob and the little girl, I was close enough in Southeast Asia to look over the edge into the pit but I wasn't wallowing in the gore at the bottom of it. Even so, it took years after my return from Southeast Asia to subdue my contempt for modern society. So many people called up and caught up in trivialities, chasing wealth and status, spouting off about defending freedom and moral goodness through military intervention when they didn't have a clue as to what it's all about at the tip of the spear. I can't say that I ever conquered those feelings, but I do try to keep them under control. Now in my senior years, <clears throat> it has become a sort of moral jungle. I can't blame Lieutenant William Cowan for the slaughter at Nalong. I can't blame Jane Fonda for reaching out to the North Vietnamese. All I know is that when people engage in war, shit happens. Things I was taught turn out to be untrue. Things I once thought were undeniable truths of life are now inaccurate, debatable, or flat wrong. There is no absolute moral truth carved in stone for all eternity, no matter how much we want it to be so. This is the price we pay for seeing past the simple answers and into the complexities of the universe. My last canto is intended to address Dr. Kunkka's <clears throat> final request for something more positive, if not downright inspirational. <laughs> it just may be that this fall into ignorance is a fortunate fall, the Felix culpa of the aging process. In a satire against reason and mankind, Rochester called reason and ignis fatuus of the mind. Ignis fatuus, a false light, a will-o'-the-wisp, swamp gas. 
which leads unwary travelers into the black and oozy quicksand. Mankind thinks reason and learning will be his salvation. But according to Rochester, they only lead him through errors, finny bogs, and thorny breaks until he is like to drown. And then the false light fades to darkness and leads him to eternal night. He says, then old age and experience hand in hand lead him to death and make him understand after a search so painful and so long that all his life he has been in the wrong. Huddled in dirt, the reasoning engine lies, who was so proud, so witty, and so wise. Now this is a tough pill for us academic types to swallow, having decided years ago, like Tennyson's Ulysses, to follow knowledge like a sinking star. We hold knowledge in such high esteem, we are all little Faustian figures to some degree selling our souls for knowledge. In Ethan Brand, one of Hawthorne's best twice-told tales, the title character leaves his useful work as a line burner and goes on a quest for knowledge. He succeeds, but at a cost. Hawthorne writes, then ensued that vast intellectual development, which in its progress disturbed the counterpoise between his mind and heart. The idea, Hawthorne puts an idea in all caps, that possessed his life had operated as a means of education. It had raised him from the level of an unlettered laborer to stand on a starlit eminence, whither the philosophers of the earth, laden with the lore of universities, might vainly strive to clamber after him. So much for the intellect. Just for Hawthorne, intellectual development, knowledge, was not the goal of life, especially if one lost hold of what he called the magnetic chain of humanity. So, losing this intellectual development with age may not be such a bad thing after all. Maybe it's another example of the irony of life. You have to travel all the way to the end of a path in order to know it's a dead end. <laughs> Once you know, you can backtrack and then move on. That's Hegel, but I'm not going there today. <laughs> so, what do we do? Perhaps we should be living more in the moment. Thoreau wrote, my life is the poem I would have writ, but I could not both live and utter it. The first thing this poem shows us is why Thoreau was seen as a prose stylist. <laughs> and not <laughs> But the message is important. <laughs> so many of us get so busy with our lives, we forget to live them. I'm trying now to live more in the present with Buddhist mindfulness, appreciating the world around me. But taking a cue from Wallace Stevens, I also give my imagination free reign and inhabit a kind of dreamscape, creating worlds that never were. So, once more, I guess, I'm simultaneously traveling divergent paths. I may be intentionally becoming more like my father by deliberately choosing imagination over reality. Who knows? Maybe he did that too. My father, I know you don't remember me being around here that much, but I remember you. I want to close with a poem I wrote for this occasion. I always wanted to be an occasional poet. <laughs> and I guess occasionally I am. I have always enjoyed reading poetry to first my children and to later my students, my other children, some of whom are here today. How many out there have been a student of mine? That's all there is on out there. This is for them. 4,521. My calculation of students in my class. Not all at once, of course. That might get rowdy. Not to mention the paper grading. <laughs> 4,521 spread over 32 years. A few dozen of whom remember my name. But that's okay. 
I'd do it all over again if I could help those few towards some epiphany. It's the following generation we try to lift, to boost them toward a dream and send them on their way. Most of them we never see again. But that's okay. We do what we can do. I watch my two main proteges, my Anna and my Jim, so busy living life, so strong and competent, I wish I had done more to be a better guide. But that's okay. They turned out fine in spite of me. And now I lean on them, two gleaming beacons along a rocky coast, creating fiery poles, emblazoned zones, imposing structure on the maelstrom sea. They give me stillness in a churning world and teach me just to be.